Thank you, John. As I was, uh, as I was listening to Jonathan pray then, I was thinking about how much I love Imperial Community Church. You know, I, I can remember, I can go back as far as I can go back and remember that this building has been here and there's been a people here. And even though I wasn't part of the congregation back in the 60s and 70s when I was growing up, uh, and never d- even thought of that I would be here as the pastor. It, it is, it's all. It was always a kind of an interesting. I was always taken by the building. Have you ever been? You ever noticed that? You know, I, I used to play along here, and uh, I can't remember who the pastor was in the sixties. He used to run me out of here. You know, he'd say, "Hey, you can't play around here." I, I try to get down in the moat, down in the moat that used to be here. You know, and uh, then when I was a real little boy, like five years old, we lived across the street. I think you all know that. And I used to come over here and get in trouble and get sent back across the street. So it's it's just great to be here today in church with you guys. I'm, I just feel blessed. Um, and then I was thinking about uh, James last night at the, in, the, in the nursery with his brand new baby boy. Tiny, he's so small, little Michael. He's so little and, and kind of thin. He's, got his, he's so small that his feet and hands look really big, you know. And, and um, as I was remembering James, he was just taken with him. He had, had him in that little... Uh, Thank you, whatever that's called. I was going to say container, a little container, <laughs> baby container. Anyways, he, and it's kind of made out of a plastic, I think, clearly. So we were all staring through the glass. Mike and Darlene were there and, and James' parents uh, and some of the kids. And he's, he was just taken by his, his uh, newborn little boy, just touching him and, and just examining him and looking at him, and he's just all caught up by it. And I remember... Our, when I, we had our first boy, too, and I remember it was like that. It just, it's just amazing. It's really amazing. So I, I'm really happy for them. Well, as you're turning to Ephesians chapter 1, last week we looked at, a, at point number 1 in point number 1. And can, you guys, uh, can you guys put that, that outline up again? Matt, can you do that for us? Put that outline up. Uh, I think it's up there on your screen. You should be able to find it. Um, maybe Brian can help you. But... Um, we looked at point number one. In point number one, the person of the greeting, and the person of the greeting, of course, was Paul, and we profiled him as such, uh, the person of the greeting. Uh, n- now we have some working knowledge of Paul. We know who he was. We know where he came from. We know um, how he became the Apostle Paul. We know all that. This morning we're going to look at two other points from our first point. And they're going to kind of overlap each other. And that would be the position of the person. Uh, number two, the position of the person, the apostle, and then the preeminence of the position of Christ Jesus. And the preeminence and the prominence, they were different last week. I decided to turn them around because, of course, Christ is the preeminence, right? He's the preeminence of the apostleship. He's the preeminence, then, of the position, which was the apostleship. And uh, Christ is definitely preeminent. Amen? He is the number one of all in the universe, the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's, let's go back to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, and we're going to read just the first part of it. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. And Jonathan's already prayed, and so we can get with it. So we have point number two, the position of the person, and that is the apostle. First of all, the word apostle, and I just want to kind of give you some preliminary information concerning Paul's claim that uh, he is an apostle. He says that, Paul, an apostle. Uh, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. That's what he says. So first of all, the word apostle or apostles, plural, uh, show up in the New Testament 86 times in the New American Standard Bible, which is the one that I'm reading. And, oh, by the way, when we, have our, when we have our corporate public reading of the Scriptures, like Jonathan just did, it might be best for you to pull out that black Bible in the pew in front of you, uh, and we can read it all together in the NASB. That way it all kind of sounds the same. So you might want to do that next week if you remember if not, whoever's reading the scripture, I will ask them to remind you that way. That way it all sounds uh, exactly from the same translation. Then, of course, you can put it back and use your own translation. So, um, see, 86 times in the New American Standard, and that shows the significance of the position. Uh, quite significant, used that many times. 19 times in singular, 62 times in the plural, and then 5 times in possessive. Um, and if you add apostleship to those words, apostle or apostles, if you add apostleship to the list, there are four more, and that makes it almost evenly 
uh, 90 times of the, of the office of apostle is mentioned in the New Testament. And to contrast that, it's not in the Old Testament at all. So you've got all, almost 90 or around 90 references to the word apostle, apostles or apostleship in the New Testament and nothing in the Old Testament. So that tells me that the office of the apostle in the context of Jesus Christ uh, was exclusive to his church or his body, his bride. And, and I believe the scripture teaches that, that this office was for a very short period of time as well, a very short period of time. That is to say that there are no modern-day apostles, biblically speaking, in the context of Paul, Paul's claim in verse 1. There are no apostles today. There's a lot of people who say they're apostles, claim to be apostles. Uh, Benny Hinn says he's an apostle, but uh, he's wrong. He's wrong. Uh, there's several others. It doesn't matter, man or woman, if they claim to be an apostle today. The scriptures are clear. Uh, there were only a few and uh, not too many, and only for a particular period of time. And we'll tell you why in just a minute. Uh, if someone were, to call, were called to be an apostle, as Paul was, he was called to be an apostle, it was unique, a special calling, to say the least. And this is why Paul opens the majority of his letters in this way, referring to himself as an apostle. Now, to start with, the word apostle, in and of itself, only has one basic meaning just means one thing. And if we use it in its general sense, we could all be called apostles from time to time. If I were to send you across the street to get something for me at Donut, you would be my apostle. Because I would be sending you over there to do something for me. You are a sent one. And so that's what it means. Even though it's used 90 times in the New Testament, it only has one basic meaning. One who is sent or a sent one. So apostle or apostolos in the Greek, apostolos means just that. Um, someone who had been officially appointed to a particular task or position. That would be called an apostle for a particular task or position. Today we might use the word representative. We're not, we're not using the word apostle anymore, are we? Exclusively, it's only seen or used in the context of the Bible or the scriptures, right? Yeah, we don't use the word apostle much. Like I said, there are people who claim themselves to be apostles. I was reading a, a, a website from a, a mission board that's sending out people uh, to another land. And uh, someone who was talking to us about, uh, talking to Susan and I personally, because we know this person personally. And uh, they, have, they have bishops and apostles in that church in leadership positions. And they really believe that it is the same equal to the Apostle Paul, which I am convinced is not so. In the first century, there were cargo ships. Cargo ships were called apostolic. Some car cargo ships were called apostolic because they were sent out for a specific purpose with a specific cargo going to a specific destination. So some of the ships were known as apostolic. I think it's wonderful that we've got babies in the church and we're going to have more. Pretty soon we're going to have... Somebody said that the church is going to be known as a baby booming church. Is that you, Whitney? Yeah, Whitney's pregnant and Veronica's pregnant again and... Uh, some of you, go ahead, get pregnant. <laughs> we'll fill up the church the next generation, right? And uh, we'll just have a great time. Well, in its broadest meaning, the word apostle carried kind of little weight. Like I said, I, you could be my apostle. I could send you over to, to Donut Avenue, and that really wouldn't mean much, right? You wouldn't be that important of an apostle because I was the one that was sending you. But in the context of the apostle Paul, he's an apostle of who? He's an apostle of... Of Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's pretty serious. That's pretty serious, to be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so anyone could be sent, depending on the reason why they were sent out, and this would give them, uh, it would give the term apostle significance. Whatever the reason or cause for the, for the sending out would give that term apostle significance, the ultimate significance in Paul's case, because he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. Apostle of Jesus Christ. And we all know who Jesus Christ is, right? He is the son of the living God. We just sang it, right? The son of the living God. He is God in human form. To have a commission by God to be called an apostle of Jesus Christ was the greatest, the greatest commission and calling that a person could ever have. An apostle, as Paul's claiming, uh, claiming to be here, 
is it being used in the general sense? Again, as I said, this apostleship is unique in its calling because the apostleship is of Christ Jesus. Now, the first time that we see the word apostle used in the New Testament, and we're going to go take a look at that, the first time we see it used in the New Testament uh, is used in, most, in a most unique, specific, and biblical way, and that's found in Matthew 10. So let's go there real quick to Matthew 10. Matthew 10. First time we see the word apostle used is in Matthew 10. We're going to be reading about eight verses, starting in verse 1 of Matthew 10. That's great to hear those pages turning. Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Now the names of the 12 Apostles, there it is, first time in the New Testament. First time in that word. And what, what identifies or defines this term of apostle means that they're being sent out by Jesus Christ himself. You see that there in the verse, don't you? Right. He sends them out. Uh, the first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, and Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon Zelotes, or Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These 12, and, and here's, the, here's the definition for the word apostle there. These 12 Jesus sent out. That's it. They are the sent out ones by Jesus Christ. After instructing them, he said, Do not go on the way of the Gentiles. Do not enter any city in Samaria, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preaching, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, Freely you have received, freely give. So we can see from this passage the uniqueness of that apostleship. The uniqueness of that apostleship, if you will. They were sent out with divine authority. And, and what was the divine? They were sent out with divine authority. And you see that in verse 6. I mean, excuse me, verse 8. Sent out with divine authority to do what? To heal the sick. To raise the dead. They're going to be doing everything that Jesus did. Jesus healed the sick. Jesus raised the dead. He cleansed the lepers. And what else did Jesus do? According to the verse, verse 8. He cast out demons. And we know that. Read the Gospels. Jesus did all of that. And so would his envoys. So would his apostles, his representatives. So I would say that their apostleship was most definitely different than all others who were sent out for whatever reasons they might have been sent out. Even if you're sent out as a, as a representative of your government, like a senator or uh, someone like that, an ambassador, these men were sent out by the Lord under divine authority to do these miraculous things. And they did. And an apostle in the context of Paul's calling, like the twelve, could truly do all these things and more. You read the book of Acts. There are other things that they did that weren't listed here uh, that made them or that proved that they were apostles. Now, because Paul was part of the twelve, not including Judas, but Matthias, I mean, uh, Judas is listed there, but we know that he didn't continue to be an apostle. Remember, he, re he betrayed Jesus and then later went out and hung himself. So he was replaced by Ma Matthias. So Matthias, in truth, and throughout e all eternity, will be the twelfth apostle. Matthias. Um, Paul was, and we could add Paul to that list, but Paul was often accused of being a phony or a false apostle because he wasn't part of the Twelve. Anytime somebody wanted to come along and question Paul's apostleship, they would. And we see Paul defending his apostleship in, in several epistles that he wrote. He will defend his apostleship. This is why he referred to himself as an apostle in several of his letters in order to authenticate that. And so... In order to do that, in order to authenticate Paul's claim as an apostle, he says this in 2 Corinthians 12, 12. You don't have to turn there. We'll turn later. But just let me read it. 2 Corinthians 12, 12. He says, the signs of a true apostle. Make sure he says true. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. Paul's saying, uh, I did those miracles. I had those signs. I am a true apostle. And so that statement from Paul brings up the question, 
And we want to answer that question today. What constitutes authentic apostleship? How do we know that the people today, and the people in the 3rd century, and the people in the 8th century, and the, those in the 10th century, and from the, from the beginning of the 1st century, how do we know that all these men who claim to be apostles outside of the 12 and the Apostle Paul, how, do we, how can we tell if they're real or not? How can we tell that their claim is true? Well, we're going to answer that. That's what we want to look at. Because Paul is claiming apostleship, isn't he? He says he's an apostle. That's what he says. He's an apostle, not only an apostle, but an apostle of Christ Jesus. How many of you have heard somebody on, uh, maybe on television or something, one of those uh, um, tele-evangelists say that he was an apostle, besides Benny Hinn. There are others who have claimed to be, that claim to be apostles. So, thankfully, we can do that. We can answer that question from the pages of Scripture. Listen, uh, as I said, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of claims of apostleship. It's nothing new. There have been false claims from the first century all the way through, even to now. And when someone out there is in Christendom says he or she is an apostle of Christ, when someone claims to be apostleship, that needs to be authenticated. It really does. I don't just take someone's word for it. I don't. There's a lot of people claiming that God has called them to preach. A lot of people claim that. A lot of people even believe that. I know some people that, I know someone years ago that said, you know, his grandma said he was going to be a preacher, so that's what he's going to be. Because his grandma said. Not because God had individually called him. So when someone out there in Christendom says he or she is an apostle of Christ, the claim requires authentication. And we want to be able to do that. And where do we get that authentication from? Where do we get it from? Get it from this right here. Get it from the scripture. Right? Only from the scripture. So, the qualifications of an apostle in the context of Paul's claims are as follows. You'll want to write these down. Number one, number one, if you're going to be a real apostle of Jesus Christ, like the ones that were listed in Matthew 10, number one, you have to have been an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ. You have to be an eyewitness of the resurrected. How many of you have seen the resurrected Jesus in all his glory? Good. <laughs> None of you are saying you have. You have to have seen the resurrected Christ after his resurrection. Now we know that the apostles saw him. They did. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and we'll read verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and we'll read verse 1. And I'll give you a second to get there. Now we're going to be turning to a lot of passages of Scripture today. So I hope you brought your Bible. And if you didn't, then you can just borrow the one in front of you in the back of the pew. 1 Corinthians 9.1 And when we get to the end of our study this morning, at about uh, 2 o'clock, I usually get very little chuckles when I say things like that. You'll see the importance of why we're doing this. 1 Corinthians 9.1 Notice, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Of course, this is Paul. Have I not, what's he say? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Or not, are you not my work in the Lord? Here Paul's claiming certain rights as an apostle. As apostle of the gospel, and his defense says, have I not seen Jesus our Lord? So he's claiming to have seen the Lord. He means in his resurrected form. That's what he means. Paul says, hey, I'm an apostle, and the reason you know that, and the way you can tell that I am authentic and not bogus, is because I have seen Jesus in his resurrection form. That's what he's saying. And he's asking, haven't I not seen that? Okay. So he means that. Notice with me Acts chapter 9. And we're just going to kind of stay in Acts for... Three or four verses. Acts chapter 9. When did Paul see Jesus? He said he did. When did he? Now let, let me remind you that the scriptures are, they're perfect. They're without error. They're the only document in this universe that is 100% accurate and trustworthy. Why? Why? Because they're written by God. These are, these are the words of God. You see, I thought men wrote it. Men wrote it, but God told them what to write. And God doesn't make any mistakes. This is Luke's eyewitness. 
or what Luke was taught from the Apostle Paul. Notice with me, Acts 9, 3 through 5. As he was traveling, this is Paul, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. You say, well, it, it doesn't say that he saw Jesus. It just says that he heard Jesus. You get that? He heard, it was a bright light, and he heard Jesus speak, and Jesus told him that it was him. But notice verse 17. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying hands on him, said, Brother Saul, I remember that's Saul's, Paul's name before, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road to on the road by which you are coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So now we get a clearer picture of what was happening. Paul says he saw a bright light, he heard the voice. Ananias says, hey, Jesus spoke to me and I know that he appeared to you. So now we know that Paul not only heard but saw. Paul, Paul saw the same thing that Peter, James, and John saw on the Mountain of Transfiguration. They saw the bright light. The bright light is what? The glory of God. And there, Jesus. Jesus. So he saw the resurrected Jesus in all his glory. Go with me to chapter 22. Chapter 22. And remember, we're, we're moving down a particular vein here. <clears throat> It'll all come together when we, all, when we get to the end. 22, 12 through 15. A certain Ananus, a man who was devout by standard of the law, but well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing near said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very time I looked upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one. That's Jesus. To see the righteous one. And to hear an utterance. From his mouth. Also, notice chapter 23. Again, we are getting biblical evidence that Paul saw the righteous one, the, the resurrected Christ. Notice 23, 10 and 11. And a great dissension was developing. The commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them and ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. But on the night immediately following... The Lord stood at his side again, see, and said, Take courage, for as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, so you must witness at Rome as well. So now we have a record again. The Lord stood at his side. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Very clear. Now, one more passage that kind of authenticates Paul's claim as an apostle of Jesus Christ, that he had seen the Lord. Turn to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And we'll be looking at verses 3 through 9. <clears throat> Verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. That's Paul. So let me ask you, does Paul qualify as an authentic apostle of Jesus Christ according to the first requirement in light of Scripture? That he has, you have to see the risen Lord. Yeah, according to the Scriptures, he has. Second, the second qualification of an apostle is this. They have to be explicitly chosen by the Lord and sent out by the Holy Spirit. They have to be specifically chosen by the Lord. And we saw that in Matthew 10, right? The Lord chose those 12, and they gave, he gave, and we, the, the writer, Matthew, gave us the names of those 12. Did you get that? 
So they have to be explicitly chosen by the Lord Jesus Christ and sent out by the Holy Spirit. Notice Acts 9. Let's go back to Acts 9. It's amazing how much information you can get from the book of Acts concerning apostleship. It's incredible. We were just there a few minutes ago. We're just reading it again. Look at verse 15. Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, he's talking about Saul or Paul, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a, what? A chosen instrument, literally a chosen vessel of mine, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So we have it. Also notice chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. So Paul was specifically and directly chosen by Jesus for a particular purpose. And that was what? To bear his name to the Gentiles. Now uh, 13, 1 through 4, verse 1. Now there were... At Antioch, in the church that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simon, who were called Nigar, and Lucius, a Cyrene, and Manian, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out, that's the meaning of apostleship, by the Holy Spirit... They went down to Cilicia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. So let me ask you, does Paul qualify as an authentic apostle of Jesus Christ according to the second requirement in light of Scripture? Yes, he does. He does. Well, let's look at the third qualification. They have to have the ability to perform signs and wonders. They have to have the ability to perform signs and wonders. In Acts 2, 42 and 43... It says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place, it says, through the apostles. Through the apostles. And that's a crucial point. Lots of people today claiming to have power to perform miracles, saying they are of God. Lots of claims like that today. I was in a circle where they made those claims all the time, but I never saw anything that was genuine. Never. And you know what? This is exactly how the Antichrist will be able to draw people to himself during the tribulation period. By making false claims. He'll have the ability to do signs and wonders. He will have the ability, like the apostles, to do signs and wonders. He'll have powerful ability to do miracles but he's not an apostle the antichrist is not an apostle but he he will have power to do miracles and that's how he'll draw people away to him Uh, so the signs and wonders he does are lying signs and wonders it's just like those who claim to be apostles today and and, you know i always think of of moses and the sorcerers in moses's day you know moses could do miracles right so could the sorcerers Sorcerers were doing miracles as well, and then eventually Moses just did more miracles than they could do themselves. But to prove what I'm saying, let me take you to a few places in Scripture that speak to this. Uh, Notice 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I told you we're going to be using the Bible a lot today. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And see what the Apostle Paul is saying about false apostles who claim to be from God. In verse 8, he's talking about the Antichrist. And he says in verse 8, Then that lawless one will be revealed, that's the Antichrist, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accordance with the activities of Satan or demonic power, demonic scheming. What this guy is doing, he's doing it in the power of the devil. They're satanic activities. And so he says, with all power, all power, this man, this antichrist during the tribulation period will have power. 
But his power and his authority is coming from who? From the devil. Yeah, from Satan. And powers, he'll have power and signs in, the NSB says, false wonders. And with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. Now, if you'll notice, these satanic miracles are called false. They're called false. Not because they're not real. It's not because they're not real. That word false there doesn't mean uh, phony. doesn't mean not real. That's not what it means. <clears throat> it's false because they are not of God. When something is not true, it's what? It's false. When something is not of God, it's of the devil. The Bible says that that would be false, which makes them lies. So the word false or false wonders can be translated lying wonders. They're false because the Antichrist is performing signs and wonders in the name of God or as if he was God. He's claiming to be God, and he'll use these signs and wonders and miracles to deceive everyone, even the Jews, and they will believe that he is the Messiah for a time. And he does it because of his power, his miraculous power. But they're deceptive. And that's what makes him false, saying that his miracles are from the power of heaven when in fact they are from the power of hell. His signs and wonders are, are manifestations of Satan's power, but they look like they're apostolic. They look like they're apostolic. Now, how do you tell the difference? How can you tell the difference when today somebody claims to be an apostle? How can you tell a difference if a man is working miracles or says he's working miracles? How can you tell the difference? Well, using the three points that confirm an authentic apostleship of Christ. That's how you tell. If someone says, you know, Benny Hinn says that he's raised the dead. He says he hasn't done it here in America, but he goes onto the mission field. And when he goes to the mission field, he raises people from the dead. Why can't he do it there, but he can't do it here? He says, well, because people don't have, they don't have enough faith. Hey, listen, faith didn't, didn't determine whether an apostle could heal or not. Faith had nothing to do with whether Jesus would heal or not. When he raised a dead person, a dead person doesn't have any faith, do they? A dead person can't exercise faith. So how do we know? Well, by putting them to the test. Let me show you another passage that speaks of Satan's power to deceive with signs and wonders. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And I'll give you the verse in a moment. I just want to set, up, set this up for you. I want you to see what's happening here so we don't have to read the whole chapter to know what's going on. Again, Paul is in defense of his apostleship. He's in defense of his authentic apostleship. And the Corinthians are disappointed in Paul. They're disappointed in Paul. And the reason is, is because he's not like the other preachers. He's not. Uh, preachers in the first century used to go to classes, and they would, they would learn how to uh, preach. They would learn how to speak. They would take uh, orator courses on how to be great. Or in fact, a lot of them would do that. They were professional speakers. Those of us who have been in the corporate world know that when you go to a seminar, those guys who do the speaking at the seminars, they've been well trained to pump you up for the business. And so the Corinthians were disappointed in Paul because he isn't like the other preachers. The others were impressive in their ability to preach. Obviously, if you'll notice in the, in the passage there, obviously Paul wasn't a skilled or dynamic speaker as he says in verse 5 and 6. Notice, for I consider myself not in the least inferior to those most eminent or super apostles. Paul's actually being sarcastic here, if you can believe it. He's calling these guys out there that everybody's saying, hey, Paul, how come you're not like that? How come you don't preach like those guys? Those guys are so dynamic. Why don't you preach like, if you're an apostle, why aren't you, so, why aren't you more dynamic in the pulpit when you're preaching? Like those other guys, and so he calls them super apostles. But he's actually being sarcastic. Look what he says in verse 6. But even if I am unskilled in speech, so maybe he's admitting it. Okay, maybe I'm not that dynamic. Maybe, even if I am unskilled in speech, yet I am not so in knowledge. In fact, in every way, we have made this evidence to you 
in all things. In other words, he may not have been skilled in speaking, but he was very skilled in the word of God. And that's what's important. That's what's important. And he tells us there at the end that the result of that skill showed in his life in every way. So you see, there were those out there with dynamic speaking abilities, as there are today. There are. And they were present in Paul's day. And they were presenting their message as if it was from the Lord. They were saying that they were messengers of God and they had this dynamic ability when they spoke claiming to be the Lord's apostles. And it's implied by Paul that they were doing it for financial gain, verse 7, and presenting their message as if it was from the Lord. But their message lacked even the basic elements of biblical truth. Uh, We were learning about teachers and false teachers in Sunday school today. Brian was teaching the class. He did an excellent job. He was accurate with the scriptures. And we were talking about... uh, false teachers, false apostles. And how if you don't know your scriptures and if you don't know your Bible well, they'll use the Bible but use it deceptively and be able to draw you away in the false doctrine. Some of those guys out there are very good at that. Very good at that. So this is why Paul mentions that he trumped their message because he preached the word. That's what he says in verse 7. He preached the gospel. And, of course, he did it free of charge. And then he goes on to say that these super apostles, although presenting themselves as messengers for God, were in truth false apostles. And it's implied in the passage that they are false because their message is false, although they were very convincing, very convincing in their ability to speak. So Paul, in verse 5 and 6, said that his preaching may have lacked pizzazz, May have lacked pizzazz, right? But not biblical knowledge. And you can tell a speaker is from God because of the content of his message. That's how you can tell. Not by by how, how great his personality is and how he can appeal to the people. I guess if you got both, that's good. You know? But a man of God is not being it doesn't have to be a great orator. He just has to be accurate with the scripture. So you can tell a speaker from God because of the content of his message, because of what he focuses on when he speaks. Is his purpose, is his intent to impart biblical knowledge or to impress you with his ability? That's the difference. So then Paul cautions and and then he exposes those he called super apostles. Notice verse 13. For For such men are what? What's he say? False apostles. In other words, they are apostles but not apostles of christ they were sent out but they were sent out by satan that's what he says these are not apostles of christ like paul was they are they're deceitful workers they disguise themselves as apostles of christ and no wonder for even satan himself disguised himself as an angel of light therefore it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness whose end will be according to to their deeds. There's a lot of people out there claiming to be of God. but Just listen to the message and look at their works. Now that I've showed you that, let's, let's look at one more passage that says, I think apostles of Christ have to perform signs and wonders in order to be legit or apostles of Christ. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 12, this is Paul speaking in defense of his authentic apostleship. Look what he says. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. Now, I've already, we've already seen this morning the signs and wonders described for us in Matthew 10, but let's go back for just a moment and look at it again. So let's go back to Matthew 10. We'll be closing up here in a few minutes. Go back to Matthew 10 and look at that again and see just what some of these apostolic signs were. Sounds like they got 20 or 30 babies in the nursery already. <laughs> Notice verse 1. Jesus 
summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Did you get that? Did you get that? Those were the signs of an apostle. How many of you got that? Right? Authority over unclean spirits, casting them out. Unclean spirit means a demon. Heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Those were the signs of an apostle. Now notice verse 7 and 8. It gets more specific. And as you go, preach. So they got to preach, of course, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Do what? Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse the lepers. Cast out demons. Freely you receive, freely give. Those are some pretty serious marks. If somebody calls himself an apostle today, they better be able to do that. Paul did. Go to the book of Acts. Check it out. You'll see. He did. They better be able to heal the sick. When Jesus was in town, there was no sick people. What happens today is they always, if a person doesn't get healed at one of their faith healing things, they say it's the person's fault. Not in Jesus' day. Jesus would empty out the hospital, so to speak. No one was sick when Jesus was around. The same was true for the apostles. There were some miraculous things going on with the apostles. They better be able to heal the sick, and it better be organic, okay? It better be real, bona fide, able to authenticate healings, not headaches and things like that. Jesus could put, give somebody a new arm. Jesus, some guy's ear got cut off, and he just gave him another one. Lepers. If you know about lepers, and it says you've got to heal the lepers, when lepers were in the, their last stages, I can't be graphic because it would probably make you sick, but they, they were losing digits. They were losing arms. Their face was coming apart. It's a very sick disease. And the Bible said that Jesus made them whole, and it happened instantaneously. And his apostles would do the same thing. So if they're going to claim to be an apostle today, an apostle of Christ, they better be able to heal the sick at all degrees. What else? Raise the dead. Raise the dead. Didn't Peter do that? Didn't Paul do that? They better be able to raise the dead. N neither one of us understands that implication. We've all been to the cemetery. They've got to be able to raise the dead. They've got to be able to cleanse lepers. And they've got to be able to cast out demons. And there's a lot of that, a lot of those claims being made today. But when a person sets out to authenticate those claims, whether they're here or on a mission field somewhere, they're never able to really, fully, completely authenticate them. It's come from, well, someone said, someone said, someone said. So did you get that? These are some of the miracles that authentic true apostles performed. And of course, as I said, you'll see them, all the apostles, or some of the apostles performing these types of miracles in the book of Acts. Just go check it out. Now, before we go, speaking of the cause of authenticating apostleship, the role of the apostles or the duties are given in Scripture as well. And uh, I wanted to talk about that real quick, and then we'll go. So, the first role or duty of an apostle argues for their uniqueness. In other words, there were only 12 plus Paul in the Bible. Only 12 plus Paul. And th what they did on earth, makes them unique. There were no other ones like them. Not since them. Never have been, and those guys that say they are are not. The first role or duty of an apostle uh, argues for their uniqueness. The office of apostle in the context of verse 12, which excluded Judas, but included Matthias, and then we can add Paul there, of course. That office died when they did. The office of apostle of Jesus Christ died when they did. And I'll tell you why. Because of the main role of the duty of those apostles, what they did was they laid the foundations of the church. That's what they did. They laid the foundations of the church. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 2. We should be there. And we'll look at that more in detail when we get to Ephesians chapter 2. But it was the, it was the apostles' duty or role or work or job what the apostles specifically did in the first century was to lay the foundation of the church. And they did that. They did that. It says in verse 19 and 20, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, 
having been built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So from this passage, I would argue that the apostles mentioned in Scripture were the only ones, and there are no more. Why? Because they were sent to lay the foundations of the church, and they did that. Ephesians tells us that. They did that in the first century. And what is the foundation? Well, that is easy. It is the message of the Lord Jesus Christ found in the pages of the New Testament. That's the foundation. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 and 11, he said, According to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. They laid the foundation in the first century, the foundation of Jesus Christ. They did that. Well, how did they do that? And we're going to close. First, they laid the foundation of Jesus Christ, the apostles and them only, by receiving, teaching, and writing God's revelation contained in the Bible. So you take a look at this right here. You take a look at the Bible that's in front of you. It's on your lap. This is the work of the apostles. This is the work of the apostles, either directly from their own hand or they told someone to write it down. This is it. This is the foundation of the church. What does the scripture teach you about? It teaches you about Jesus Christ, God come in human form to die for our sins. So they have to be able to receive, teach, and write God's word contained in the Bible. So we don't need apostles today because God's revelation is complete. God's word is complete. We don't need apostles anymore. We don't. The work they did isn't needed today. There's no revelation being given. The Bible is done. It's complete. It's been complete since the first century. There's no more new revelation to be given. Second, apostles' duties were to preach the gospel. Third, teach and pray. Fourth, work miracles. Fifth, build up others, other leaders in the church. And sixth, again, write the word of God. And these duties constituted the laying of the foundation of the church, which is Jesus Christ. So the key role of the apostle was to lay the foundation of the church and they did that when they walked on the earth. They did that when they walked on the earth. So we have the position of the person, the apostle, and we have the preeminence of the position of Christ Jesus and Paul was sent out by Jesus Christ. So next time, we'll look at the prominence of the position by the will of God. So as we close, what is... What is the significance of what we've seen today? Why is this so important? Why did I spend the time to show you that Paul was an authentic apostle? Why did I do that? Well, because the riches that are found in this book, if they are true spiritual riches, if they're going to benefit you in any way spiritually, then the one who wrote them has to be an apostle, a real apostle, or they're worthless. It's just another book out there that that was written, that somebody wrote to make some money on. These, however, because Paul is an authentic apostle, are 100% reliable, they're 100% true. You can bank on it, you can believe it, you can trust it for your soul, for your eternal soul, because they're written by an authentic apostle of Jesus Christ, whose name is Paul. That's why it's so important. That's why we took the time to look at it so that we can see that he really is a genuine apostle, and you can trust this with your spiritual life. It's true riches. Well, let's pray. Let's pray. And uh, uh, Tristan, you can go get ready for your baptism if you want to sneak around the back. Father, we are thankful for your word. We know most of all, Lord, that the content of preaching is the most important part. It's what, it's what sanctifies our soul. It's what makes us more like you. It's what pleases you as, as our God, as our Lord. And we know from Scripture this morning that, that um, Paul is definitely an authentic, legit, bona fide, called by Jesus Christ, 
apostle. Therefore, he had all the authority to write your word. In other words, to be a liaison of communication between you and us. Thank you that we have the Holy Scripture. The Bible says that the Holy Scripture is to make us wise unto salvation. And even from a passage such as this, somebody could come to Christ. Even from preaching a message such as this, a message that authenticates Paul's apostleship, doesn't lack in power to save an individual because it's, it's not me, it's not my voice, it's not my, my articulation, it's not my personality. Whether I'm dynamic or not, it's the power of God unto salvation. It's the word of God, it's the power of God unto salvation. The gospel. Perhaps there's somebody here today, Lord, even as we are wrapping things up this morning in our public worship that doesn't know you in a personal way. And you would say, yes, that is true. I, I, I don't know Christ. I, I don't know this, this God who is all-powerful, who had enough power to give that to some of his own men who were able to do the mighty works that he did. Maybe, maybe you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ in a personal way like, like Paul did and like, many of us do well you can you can make that to be true today you can recognize that you are without Christ you can recognize that you're separated from the body of Christ uh, because of your sin your personal sin and ask him to forgive you pray a simple prayer Lord forgive me for my sin save me from my sin Give me a home in heaven. Maybe you're here today and you would say, by the raise of your hand, you would say, Pastor, um, I pray that prayer right now. I ask Jesus to be my Savior. Anybody at all before we go? Anyone at all? Father, thank you for this day. Again, thank you for your word. We pray for your blessing now uh, as we... Uh, Prepare for baptism. In Jesus' name, amen. David, what's our last hymn? We're going to give uh, Tristan some time to get ready. What's the number? 323. Let's all stand. At the cross. Let's sing the first one. And hopefully uh, Tristan will be ready by then. Amen. At last ended. At last ended my Savior bleed and did my sovereign die. Would he devote that for such a... At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was... Let's sing the last one. But drops of grief can the debt of love I owe. But you guys sound like a choir at the cross. And the burden of my heart rolled away. Thank you. Okay, this is uh, 
Tristan Rojas, and uh, I've known him for a long time. He used to go to Grace Baptist Church in El Centro when I was the pastor there, him and Chris Carter, their cousins, and they used to come together to the Awana clubs, and there he learned about what salvation is. He learned about what it means to be saved. And then I hadn't seen him for a long time because we left Grace Baptist and left the valley for a while and came back. And then I saw him. I've, been, I've seen him a few times since then here. And last week he came and we had a talk about salvation and about Christ. And he told me that the Lord's really been dealing with his heart. And um, he just really believes the Lord has, has called him to faith in Jesus Christ. And we talked about baptism. He came to the office and we discussed a little more about his, uh, his personal faith. And uh, Tristan, do you want to say anything to everybody? Yeah. Um, I, won't. I don't know. I just, I really do believe like Jesus Christ is my Savior and I want to get baptized so that and for him to be buried again and resurrected. All right. Very good. So you've already made your profession of faith to the public. So uh, we're going to take care of that. Are you ready? So now you want to be a follower of Jesus Christ, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, here you go, John. Well, uh, Tristan, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I now baptize you, my brother. You have to let go of the flag. Yes, I now baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen. Make sure you pray for Tristan. He's a new believer now. And he uh, wants to walk in the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. So be praying for him. Amen. Amen. David, would you lead us in a closing prayer? And then we'll be dismissed.